Welcome to the Star of Brian. Hey Tom, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for uh, inviting me to be here. Not a problem. Let's get straight into it. Um, let's start with the basics um, for all of us that don't know Tom. Uh, give us a brief background about yourself, uh, when, how, why you started Pandora, or joined Pandora, sorry. Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm, <clears throat> uh, I'm the CTO and head of product at Pandora. That means that, <clears throat> which means uh, different things in different companies. Pandora, it happens to mean I run product management, user experience, design, engineering, technical operations, customer service, and internal IT, and business systems, kind of anything that has a server attached to it is somewhere in my world. I've been with the company for nine years, uh, just about nine years. Um, uh, I joined a company called Savage Beast in 2004. Savage Beast um, had this, this thing called the Music Genome Project at, uh, uh, that was designed to connect um, uh, fans with uh, artists and they, they licensed it to other consumer brands who had put it into products as kind of an ingredient technology. Um, I joined, our CEO Joe Kennedy joined, um, Tim Westergren, uh, the company's founder, Joe and I began the work that led to the creation of Pandora about a year later uh, in the summer of 2004. My background's like a mix of consumer software, enterprise software. I worked at Apple on the Macintosh in the early 90s. I was technical director for a video game series called You Don't Know Jack, which somehow 15 years later there's still, there's a new version for the iPhone, popular game on Facebook. Um, uh, I ran engineering at pets.com, so I just about destroyed the US economy by myself. Um, Probably don't want to go back into that. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, so, and you know, dot, 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 here we are today. Very, very good, very good. Okay, well, can you explain to our audience um, in the early days, pre-IPO, um, what was it like following on Sammy, I guess? Uh, what was the culture like as a humble startup uh, and pre-IPO, up to pre-IPO? Yeah, so, I mean, most of the, the company's history is, uh, is the pre-IPO part. We went public a year and a half ago, um, which I guess would have meant that the, we'd been building the company for over 10 years to get to that point. So um, uh, I think like, like most, uh, most rock bands, Pandora, it was an overnight success 10 years in the making. Um, uh, we just hired somebody who I think captured the, the essence of, of our culture maybe better than I've ever heard it articulated. And he said to me, he said, you know what I like about this place is that everybody who works here uh, acts like they're an un that Pandora is the underdog. And that really is kind of how uh, uh, I feel about it, how we feel about it. We were never the sexy Silicon Valley company that everybody wanted to work for, that was on the breadth of every venture capitalist, just waiting in line to get a meeting with us. Um, uh, we were, you know, just out there kind of grinding away. Um, in startup grind fashion. In startup grind fashion. Um, just, uh, you know, working to build a product that we hoped could be, you know, the best in the world at something. Oh, that's great. Well, um, well how about looking back at the IPO now? Like, uh, forget the stock price today. Uh, one of the, what are some of the challenges that you've faced? But, I mean, you've, you're obviously the CTO of uh, Pandora. Maybe from a technology point of view. How have things changed pre-IPO and now today? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, the impact on the, the, on the technology staff is, it's, it's actually pretty modest. Maybe we just, I'll, I'll start more broadly and we can come back to the technology no piece. Worries. I, the, um, mostly, the startup is just, it's just a thing that happens. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a moment in time. Like I said, it was a year and a half ago now. Um, it's pretty firmly in the rearview mirror. It uh, did not dramatically change the, the company, I think, really for any of us. Um, the, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes along with going public that's about um, you know, compliance and accounting practices and um, just creating a, uh, a situation that ensures that anybody who might like to invest in the company can confidently review your financials and um, uh, that there's kind of a level playing field among the various investors or potential investors in the company. Um, so there's a whole bunch of regulations and things that go along with that. But in every instance, it felt, the work that we did to, to, to meet those requirements felt like the natural extension of the maturity of the business. I mean, a great example is, 
when you go public, one of the things that they tell you is like, you know, you need to demonstrate to us that you have a set of policies and procedures that you enact when somebody leaves the company, such, so, such that they can't get access to your financials or your servers or, or whatever. Yeah. Doesn't that seem like a good thing to have? <laughs> you know, I think lots of startups don't formalize anything like that, which is perfectly healthy too when you're, you know, 14 people in a, mm -hmm. in a you know, a basement somewhere. Um, but when you're 500 people and, and uh, you've got, you know, people's uh, investments, public market investments riding on the company, it's probably a good idea to, to, to implement those kinds of things. Um, and so in, in every instance it felt a little like that. Like this is a thing that we need to do that's consistent with the level of maturity of the company and not so much like some kind of red tape that goes along with being public. I will tell you that there's one thing um, that stands out in my mind though um, that was a change for me and that is that I'm a big believer that the way you best interact with the, the community of entrepreneurs that surround you, the, uh, the way that you interact with your listeners, um, is at its best when you're being completely candid and transparent. Mm -hmm. um, and we, as a result, have always been reluctant to try to put words into the mouths of our employees to say, here's the way you should talk about this thing that we're doing. Um, or you know this opportunity that we face um, outside of some of the normal confidentiality things, um, uh, we've really never restricted what people say at all. Mm -hmm. you know, some you know, writes in and says, you know, I'm having trouble with this feature. It's kind of perfectly fine with us if the, the person who's responding to that email responds completely candidly and says, yeah, I think that feature kind of sucks too, um, because it makes you human and companies like benefit from, I mean, companies are made up of, of, of real live human beings and I think a lot of times we try to polish all of that away so we seem, you know, like a corporation. Um, and so one of the things that happens though when you go public is that there are suddenly a whole bunch of dimensions of the business that you do have to be especially careful about talking about publicly because what you can't do is you can't give a small group of people, say every person in this room, an insight into the business that the broader market of investors don't have access to as well. So now when you ask me a question about, ah, Tom, like how many servers do you have? And then maybe you follow up with like, well, how many servers did you have last year? I've got to be like running in my head this thing of like, ah, I can't really answer that question because some savvy analyst might be able to extrapolate something about our growth that the public market doesn't broadly have access to. Um, the specifics of not being able to share that stuff isn't so detrimental, it's just that that inner monologue you then have to have, it's like where you're kind of almost we, constantly sort of editing. Pre, yeah, so we were you pre-advised by sort of your VCs pri prior to the IPO and, and then post-IPO, I guess, with reporting to shareholders, it changes the whole ball game. Yeah, the, so there's, there is that the piece. There is that piece. I don't love that, that, that bit of, of not being in every instance to be able to just to speak from my heart. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what about sort of innovation? Do you find that okay, post-IPO, I've got all these shareholders to re report to. Uh, does innovation sort of take a back seat or are you sort of freely still able to sort of dip into it? Yeah, I think there's still tons of innovation at Pandora. Um, uh, that's sort of job one when we get up and, and, and go to work in the morning in my organization. Um, a lot of that energy goes into, not to things that you can see on the screen, but things that you can hear. And we're very, very focused on making the best playlists in the world. and. Um, uh, you know, every day, that's job number one for us, you know, to ask the question of, you know, when you type in the Beatles, what songs play in what order, with what amount of familiarity, with what amount of repetition, how does that experience change over a day, a month, a year of listening? Um, that's really the, the innovation game for us. Um, uh, maybe the only thing that's, that's uh, in the running with that then is, to, making the platform sort of ubiquitously available. So if we're gonna take on, you know, defining what the future of radio looks like, it's really in part about being on every bedside table, in every kitchen, in every family room, in every car, in every, you know, pocket at the gym. Um, uh, so we're very focused on that as well. But, uh, you know, from very, very early, um, Pandora was, focused on building a long-term sustainable company. This is what you heard from the, the guy from Trulia as well. And the costs of delivering a streaming music service are such that 
if you're interested in building a long-term sustainable company, you have to talk about the business model every single day. That has to be part of the conversation. How are we going to make enough money to pay the rights holders um, uh, for this month's bandwidth bill? Um, and frankly, uh, there are enough kind of skeletons by the roadside where it comes to, to digital music services that you can't really even get investors to buy into a story that doesn't demonstrate a path to, to solving that problem. And so from the very beginning, we were talking about um, monthly and quarterly financial goals, revenue goals for the company, and evaluating the way that we spend money against those milestones. Um, so really, the conversation about um, the quarterly objectives on the revenue side, the quarterly objectives on the expense side, how we're tracking against those things, we certainly do that um, uh, now, today, after the IPO, but we have been doing it for years and years and years before the IPO, and so that, that part doesn't feel like a shift to me. Oh, excellent. Fair enough. Uh, let's, let's shift the conversation uh, to talk about your competitors, uh, your new competitors. Um, how do you stay ahead of um, new subscription services such as Spotify, your RDOs of the world? Sure. So, you know, it, it's fascinating to watch the industry react to new entrants into the digital music space. Um, uh, every time someone new launches, it's as though they're the first competitor to come along um, you know, in our history. But the, the truth is, is that we, um, we've had very, very strong competitors from the day we launched in 2005. And when we launched, uh, Yahoo had a product called LaunchCast. Uh, AOL had a product called AOL Radio. Both were hugely popular. Um, Yahoo had a, you know, a position in the overall kind of market share for internet radio that was a little bit like Pandora's today. You know, 70 plus percent of all internet radio listening was to Yahoo LaunchCast. Um, they no longer have a service uh, in our space. AOL also exited the business. Um, shortly after we launched, um, we were joined by another startup called Last.fm that had um, a very similar personalized radio product and was um, uh, a strong competitor in those early days. Um, later, there was, you know, you remember iMeme and um, Playlist.com. They both had like 30 million monthly uniques um, at their peak. I like built a business of tens of millions of, of music listeners on Facebook. Uh, the original iHeartRadio launched about three years ago, Spotify about a year and a half ago in the US. Um, in, in no instance, did the kind of wind come out of our sails? And I think, um, I think that's because we are relentlessly focused on one particular thing and doing it very, very well, which is delivering an incredibly simple, personalized radio-like service. You press a button, music you love comes out. There's, there's kind of no more or less to it than that. And um, uh, I think what's often missed, missed by the pundits that sit on the sidelines is that when you look at the overall uh, music consumption in the United States, about 80% of the hours of music listening comes from traditional FM radio, and 20% comes from owned music, uh, on-demand stream music, stolen music, the whole category. And I think as, as entrepreneurs and people who, who that the entrepreneurs that, that start digital music companies, we tend to think that everyone is like us, and you know they have 100,000 MP3s on their laptop, and an iPod that's full, and you know, uh, they love to make playlists and things. The reality is that most of the mainstream kind of um, uh, audience doesn't behave that way. They just want to be entertained and hear music that they love. And so we're really, really focused on doing that really well. I'd say we're the future of radio. Daniel Eek at Spotify says they're the future of the record store. Record stores and radio stations have a neat kind of symbiosis. They don't compete with each other. Um, so, uh, and, and you were telling me backstage, I think, uh, the licensing between radios and... Uh, very, very different very licensing different. models. The underlying economics are, are very different for a subscription business versus a, a radio-style business. Um, truthfully, though, I think just broadly where competition is concerned, um, I'd you know, encourage you to not fall into the trap of... of um, uh, focusing on what your competition is doing. You certainly should pay attention to it. You should understand it. You should you know, learn lessons where you can. But um, my experience has been, if you find a real problem that everyday people have, you focus on providing the best solution in the world to that problem, competition kind of sorts itself out. Excellent. 
Um, I think um, I think when I first heard that I was going to be interviewing you, I got quite excited because um, for for those that don't know, uh, Pandora was one of the Australia. Sorry, Australia was the first country to launch um, Pandora outside of the U.S. So, uh, can you tell tell the audience? Uh, why is it difficult to sort of uh, expand internationally and what are some of the hurdles? Because it's not simply as snapping your fingers and I'm going to be all over the world. What are the, some of the difficulties? Yeah. So when we launched in 2005, um, we understood that we had licenses to deliver the service in the US only. And, and at the time, the only technical means we had to determine where uh, a listener was coming from was in the registration process we asked you to, to enter a US zip code, and, and in the terms of service, it explained that it could only be listened to in the United States. Um, we literally didn't have the technology to do kind of IP-based um, uh, geography lookup. And uh, so in the beginning, we did uh, grow a bit of an audience overseas. Um, uh, um, and we put people in place around the world who were working on getting licenses for um, other um, territories. Uh, and we certainly dramatically underestimated just how hard that would be. Uh, there's really no other place in the world that has a licensing system for internet radio that, that is analogous to what we have here in the United States. The typical case is you have to go record label by record label, country by country, and secure licenses um, directly. Um, so we've been. Um, working at that in places like the UK and Canada and China and Japan and all over the world for a long time. Um, uh, and the great news is that we had a kind of breakthrough with the rights holders in Australia and New Zealand and um, uh, quickly um, made changes to the service to allow us to, to operate um, uh, in both countries and we launched uh, kind of in a beta in the fall and, and then had a full launch uh, just before the Christmas holiday. And it's super fun uh, because it's like starting over in many ways. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the conversations we have with our new listeners in both Australia and New Zealand feel just like the conversations that we had with um, our original listeners here in the United States. And so it's, uh, it's really invigorating. Um, and certainly it's been a point of disappointment and frustration that we haven't been able to find those same opportunities in other parts of the world, but we're going to keep trying. Have you got any feedback from the Australians or any stats to share? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, because of that, that SEC thing I mentioned, I can't share stats with you, but um, uh, the feedback has been uh, tremendously, tremendously positive. The application is doing really, really well in the app stores. Um, and uh, uh, the, you know, we made a rookie mistake. Uh, we, let's see, we did two things come to mind. Um, when we launched in beta, and you know, to be fair, we wanted to get it out there quickly, and so we, we launched knowing that we were going to make some mistakes. Um, but on the website, uh, we kind of promote stations for holidays. And uh, when we launched, we were right in the middle of promoting uh, summertime stations. Uh, it was the dead of winter in Australia. Yeah. Um, so that was, uh, that was embarrassing. Was the rookie mistake that you got the seasons wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and then similarly, we have um, uh, our founder, Tim, recorded some kind of um, audio messages to welcome people to the service. And uh, we've had some feedback of like, who's this American? What's with his accent? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so uh, uh, little things like that. Excellent. Um, OK, well, um, we'll wrap it up. Uh, I just want to ask one final question before I put it to the audience. Uh, it's the dream of many entrepreneurs, many sitting in this room, to sort of sell your company for a tidy sum or take it public one day. Is it as glamorous as it sounds? Well, the funny thing about, about going public is that um, in many ways, you know, the Truly guy said it, it's not an exit. It's kind of literally not an exit. If you're, if you're uh, a senior executive in the company, your liquidity is incredibly modest, um, you know, because uh, the market watches what you do with your stock and so forth. Um, so, uh, um, you know, I think our, our, our ambition from the beginning was to, to, to create an enduring company that could stand the test of time. And, I mean, I remember very clearly in you know, uh, 2005, 2006, 2007, people would ask that 
you know, what's your exit strategy question. And like um, the guy from Trulia, you know, I always just kind of smiled and said, you know, our ambition is to create a great product that people love yeah. and, um, and build this into a lasting company and brand. Um, and when pressed, they would say, well, what does that mean? Like, you have investors, you know, what does that mean? And I would say, like, I don't know, I, I, I guess it means we go public at some point. Um, but, like, I remember kind of whispering it under my breath because it was ludicrous at that point in the company's history and, frankly, in the history of Silicon Valley to think that any consumer software company was going to go public ever again. <laughs> um, uh, so it was... Uh, it was a remarkable moment to, to, to stand up there and to be amongst uh, my colleagues and, and literally ring the bell, um, just as a moment to reflect on, you know, the closing of the first chapter and stepping into, you know, the, uh, the rest of the history of the company, which we hope will be, you know, long and, and, and storied. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, Dom, I think... Yeah. Any questions? Gentleman down front. Right. Yeah, so having tackled the, the music licensing in the U.S., did you find that when you went, went international that you were able to uh, get a bigger foothold in, uh, against a competition like, say, Spotify? Um, the licensing structure for, for radio-style services is generally um, – economically more viable than the licensing structure for an on-demand music service like Spotify. Um, principally on the theory that um, radio traditionally is a kind of um, awareness and marketing channel for the purchase of music. I mean, oftentimes you fall in love with the song you hear on the radio, which is what motivates you to purchase. Um, and the theory for on-demand services and such is that they're, they they're substitutional for purchasing music. Instead of buying the album, you consume it on demand from a streaming service. And so the underlying kind of economic theory and licensing costs are, are pretty profoundly different, actually. Hi, thanks. Um, so a few years ago, I joined a company that had had a really successful IPO. And uh, what I quickly found out was that there were kind of wide disparities of wealth across the same job titles depending on when you join the company and it actually led to a lot of issues culturally and I was wondering if you're beginning to see that kind of stuff yet. Well it is certainly a fascinating part of the process that there's a batch of, of um, uh, employees whose compensation becomes uh, very you know visible in the process of, of taking a company public and um, I think we navigated those waters pretty successfully. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I would, uh, I would challenge you to, as you're going through the, uh, the process of building your company, to be constantly sort of conscious about internal equity amongst players and, and, um, and reviewing, you know, is everyone where they should be, um, you know, not just relative to the, their market comps, but to their internal comps as well. Um, because I think, as you say, there, there, there's room to fall into to a trap there. Tom, what about uh, countries like Germany, where you actually stopped delivering your service because of legal or license reasons? Are you still negotiating over there, uh, or do you say, let them rest in peace? Uh, so the, 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 the story there is that we ultimately implemented the more sophisticated... Um, IP-based uh, geography blocking, which cut off people in Germany, for example, that had decided that they, um, you know, wanted to mimic a U.S. zip code or whatever. Um, we continue to, you know, be excited about the opportunity in Europe. Um, the licensing dy dynamic there is complicated. Um, uh, again, we're just waiting for the moment where there's a set of um, licenses on offer that are economically viable that will allow us to create a long-term sustainable business there. We'd love to come back to Germany. Hi. Uh, my question is, um, over the past several years, uh, Pandora has definitely become synonymous with personalization on the internet to the point where people say, my startup's the Pandora of X and Y. And just wondering how that, um, do you guys still see yourselves as leaders in personalization and thoughts about that? I mean, it really is job number one 
um, at Pandora, you know, we do a lot of um, analysis of, of what makes Pandora successful with our audience, what features are they engaged in, and as we evolve the product over time, how does listening behavior change? Um, and the thing that is by far the highest leverage for us is when we make fundamental improvements to the, the personalization um, in the listening experience itself, um, that's when we see moves with respect to how often people come back, how many people they tell about the service, the duration of their individual sessions, the ratio of thumbs up to thumbs down improves. Um, uh, I think the, uh, we can never take our eye off the ball there, and I think we're far from done. Like, you know, I think there's lots and lots of things that all of us could describe that have happened to us on Pandora that seem, um, that leave room for improvement. Um, so we're very focused on that for sure. And it's incredibly flattering that anybody ever says they're the Pandora of X, kind of thing you never, never get tired of hearing. Okay, I'll give, it, give um, Tom a round of applause, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Nice.